a lot of people think, well, aren't you happy or glad that it happened? Because look what you've, where you've been. You've been over the world. Um, but I didn't get a ticket to the London Paralympic Games. I didn't get a ticket to the Commonwealth Games. You know, I've worked really worked, hard for yeah. what yeah. I've, yeah. I've done and I chose to do that. I chose to pick myself up and, and do motivational speaking and, and put a face out there for people with disabilities and, and do what I do. No one's ever lucky. I, mean, I think the only lucky game in life is where you're born and then you make the rest. Stick around, it's going to be a good ride. Hey lads. Hey Dan. I've got a question. Boys. Yeah, mate. Got a question, mate. Yeah, I'm, mate. Now, it, like you always talk to me about the crypto world and got a the metaverse. Oh, we're and, going there. And we're going to go there. Got to get into it, Dan. It's the <laughs> it's the next big thing. Blah blah blah. I had a bit of a look the other day. Well, it was a bit of noise in the media. What's happened to it? Is it plummeting? No, What's no, going no. on? No, no comment. What's that? Oh, Pete's going. Pete's actually gone. He's. <laughs> Because you boys are you're telling me, you know. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Well, tell, I ask tell the question, so tell, tell me. Tell him? Yeah, I'll fucking Can tell, you him. tell him. If you want to make money, <laughs> if you want to make money, now is the time. Now is the time, man. No, no, yeah, all jokes hard. aside, like- um, Not, what, um, Zachy, not financial advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Not financial advice, but for sure. But if you remember the advice that I gave you, the original advice was scale in. That's the key. You got to scale in. So even back then, you scale a little bit in each week, and then over, I don't know whatever happens in the market, you end up with the average price. But now, I'd go pretty heavy if you, if you can if you can get some money out the ashtray and put it in. Now's a good is, time. Is it the old? The more you put in, the more you get out. And it's also the more you can lose. <laughs> it's not looking good. No, 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 no. It is. No, no, no. You know that's that's the beauty, man. Like not even being funny. That's the fucking beauty because that's the lion's share of people think, oh, it's not looking good. Now's the greatest opportunity. If you wanted to get into crypto, now is the time. Not when it's at the top. It's when it's at the bottom when everyone's saying, don't do it, it's shit, it's burning and it's a waste of money, it's a Ponzi, but not financial advice. Anyway, wow. that's what we're telling ourselves. We'll be back, PK. I'm glad I left it in my own pocket. That's all I'm glad about. <laughs> we're coming back, mate. We're so coming back. Safe in the pocket. It's safe in the pocket. <laughs> Bricks and mortar. Can't be, can't be bricks and mortar. Well, you've never heard. You've, no, no, no. no well, you, it's not safe in the pocket because that's inflation, man. Inflation just eats it away. A dollar today is not worth a dollar next year, man. That's the point. Bricks and mortar. Bricks the land, and mortar. The land down, Ooh, the down land the coast. Is. Bricks and mortar, Ooh, mate. The land, yeah, down, mate. Down where Hollywood hangs out, it is. <laughs> They're not making any more land. The ocean there. breeze. <laughs> We're going to get into it, boys, or Let's we're going to turn it into a financial it. advisory no, definitely podcast. Not that. Oh, Jeez. Imagine oh, that. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> All right, guys. Welcome back to Australia's number one podcast. We are the little fish, and we speak to the big fish about town each and every week. We talk property, mindset, development, business, life, bringing you guys as much value as possible. Please like, share, subscribe. Thanks for viewing. Thanks for listening. Algorithm loves it, Benny. Algorithm loves it. Dan, tell your family, tell your friends. This guest today, guys, so much value, so many lessons in it. Mm. So strap yourselves in and share it with anyone you think is going to get value. Today's guest has an athletic track record that makes the rest of us look like a sack of couch potatoes. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Couch <laughs> potato, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Even after recovering from a rare and aggressive cancer at the tender age of 15. After being forced to retire her netball career, our next guest quickly set her sights on the stages far more dazzling than your old local footy netball club. Mm. The top of the podium being crowned best above knee amputee, 100 metre sprinter in the world, little did she know sprinting was just the beginning. She's a multi-world recording breaking athlete. Wow. It's wordy, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And power lifter. <laughs> well, you've done a bit. You yeah. know. And power lifter. Whose wow. trophy cabinet has its own postcode, boys? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and dope. she's a superstar mother to boot. Give it up for Paralympic gold medal winner Callie Cartwright. Yeah. Hey, Cal. Wow, cheapers. Seems that was like a it. lot of awards. Or a lot of is there gold medals there? There's bloody oath. Oh. Yeah, there's oh. bloody oath, man. There's a, there's a <laughs> slew of them, dude. Wow. Oh. Wow. Sorry, they've put them away now. <laughs> One of them in particular. The uh, the high, is, is a grail, isn't it? It's a it's an Olympic gold medal. Yeah. Uh, long jump. Long jump. Long jump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks yeah. for coming in, Kelly. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome to have you on. Uh you've yeah. There's so much to get through here. Can we start back the early days in Geelong, God's country down Geelong? <laughs> uh back there, sporting family, big into your netball. 
Yeah. Family was big into sport, that sort of thing. What was it like growing up down there? Yeah, so I actually grew up in Port Arlington, which is a, a small little oh, country okay. town. Yeah. 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 Um, grew up next to the beach, had two older brothers who um, probably made me into the person I am today. Growing up with two older tough brothers and they absolutely loved their football and obviously with football clubs in little towns is a netball part of it. And mm. um, as soon as I can remember, I thought uh, I want to play netball for Australia. That was sort of my goal even from the age of nine, I think. And, um, you know, we'd walk to the football club, I'd train, umpire, play, We'd have dinner dinner down there on a Thursday night, yeah. like you do as in the country. Hardcore, town. hardcore, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that was like the highlight of the week when you're ten years old. And yeah, I absolutely dreamed of playing netball for Australia. I lived it, and uh, I was very lucky to have the upbringing that I had with beautiful parents and grandparents living with me, and just a really small community. Um, yeah, yeah. very lucky. Yeah, I yeah. guess one thing the audience who aren't in Victoria or South Australia, they don't really understand that country town feel of the football netball club on a no. Thursday night. you were country as well. Oh, I was country. So was he. Yeah, it's so was he. Wang, a, up in Wang. It's a great way to be to be brought up really because yeah. all your mates are down at the footy club, but then, you know, all the girls play netball and it's the same sort of club. So every Thursday night you'd mingle and it was just a good vibe. It's a good way of growing up. Every, yeah, everybody does know everybody though. And that can sometimes happen. <laughs> definitely um, didn't get away with anything ever. You know, yeah. whoever owned the fish and chip shop and the news agency definitely told my mum yeah. what I was up to doing <laughs> most weeks. But it was, it, it is, it's really great to be part of um, that sort of community, the clubs. Yeah, hundred percent. That's what I know. I'm from Wangaratta. Come to Melbourne. Melbourne doesn't have the country football netball clubs. Mm. They're probably in a bit more isolation. And now that I'm down Geelong, you get back to the grassroots mm. and the and the community vibe. Yeah, definitely. I, I lived in Melbourne for seven years and. Didn't think I'd go back to Geelong, but I did a few years ago, and I'm thankful to have the opportunity to bring my kids up yeah. there now. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my mindset as well. Yeah, love it, love it. So, your family's full into sport. You're full into sport. Your knee started to hurt around the age of 13. Yeah. Can you take us there and talk us through that yeah. time in your life? Yeah, I was very sport orientated, so I did cross country running. You name it, I was doing it, and then unfortunately. But from the age of 13 to 15, I kept telling my parents and doctors that my knee was getting so severe that I couldn't even sit in class for too long, couldn't cross my legs. People would mm. tap me on the knee to get my attention and I'd probably be in, pa- in pain for the next two hours. And yeah. for two years, I put it down to growing pains and, um, you know, netball injuries and things like that until one time the doctor just said, you just need to give it a rest and we'll do a scan, see what's going on. Uh, got a scan. They said, it's a cyst, leave it alone, it's fine, it will, it'll go away by itself. Or you can have two weeks off school. And I have to admit that um, school wasn't my strong point. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I got two weeks off school, which was great for me. Went to hospital and thought everything was, was cool. And then they called my parents two weeks after my operation and told all three of us to come in. And I remember that day like it was yesterday, to be honest, and I said to my mum, there's something wrong, like why – are they calling us just after some minor surgery? And mum reassured me that it was fine and that's when the doctor sat all three of us down and, and said, unfortunately, it wasn't a, a cyst inside your knee. It was a rare form of cancer called synovial sarcoma. Um, I was 15 and obviously I just heard the words cancer and I mm. thought, I'm going to die. That's literally all I thought in my head was I'm going to die. Mm. Uh, and it was a really hard moment, not only for myself, but my parents. And I looked at them for strength, but of course they were heartbroken and um, in a state of shock. So it was really hard to lean on them because they were devastated. Mm. And, you know, my, in that instant, my whole world just, you know, turned upside down. And I, I thought I'd heard the worst of it, but, you know, it was a, it was a big road ahead after that. Oh, 100%. And I know, I know Benny, he came in this morning, did the research. When you've got young girls, that sort of, you know, that, yeah, it was that, tough. That, that, that moment when you said the parents were hurting, you know, um, yeah, that, that hit home with us because we've got young girls and, you know, you, you know, you just couldn't wrap my, I honestly couldn't wrap my head around it, you mm. know, like it's just, it's, it's, it's quite, I think I heard you say it, it's crazy as humans, you don't, realize how resilient you can be until I think I heard you say in an interview somewhere until you sort of put in a situation and you, you start to realize that we are resilient and we can get through but yeah that was tough just listening that yeah when you found out and you needed to you know you're looking for your parents for strength but they were at their weakest sort of thing because their world had sort of collapsed as well like yeah. it, are they processing absolutely 
They're probably just processing what's been said and I think I think mum was just devastated. I remember her just bursting into tears and dad was asking this surgeon who had never seen this type of cancer a million questions he couldn't even answer. So dad went into research mode right. straight uh, away. Uh, yeah. Doctor Google, Doctor Google. Well he went on Doctor Google and <laughs> yeah. then I went on Doctor Google after him and looked up what he researched. That's not a great idea. But no. um, that's sort of what dad dad didn't sleep for the whole week from then to you know, to what what was gonna happen next and um, you know, it's it's weird because a lot of people always say to me, oh, 15 years old, as tough as it is, um, it's tough enough as it is mm. to also go through something like this. And although I don't think any age is going to be easy to lose your leg and be diagnosed with cancer, um, I think what saved me now looking back and having my own children, I was naive a bit at the time as well of how serious it was. Even though I thought cancer, death, you know, I didn't, I was a bit optimistic. I didn't really realise what was next. And I think that's what saved me a little bit. But I look back on my parents and think, Wow, if if that was my child, I would yeah. be absolutely mm. heartbroken. Yeah, hundred crazy, crazy. I, I think for me, like I, you're a 15 year old, um, you're growing up, you're sort of developing. You get that news. How do you personally process it and take it on board? And yeah, and share it with your friends and mm. try and comprehend what is next. Oh, uh, look, the the person who gave me the diagnosis sent me off to another surgeon who dealt with cases, and that was the one that gave me the the choice and that was I didn't even realize that you could a get cancer in your knee or b it would result in amputation but my choices were get my leg cut off four inches above my knee or radical surgery to try and remove the rest of the cancer but they were sure I'd still have the cancer because it was quite deep Mm. um but the way I processed it in that moment was no I'm gonna I'd rather die than have my leg amputated and I walked out of the doctor's room and my parents stayed in there for a little while and he said I'll give you five days to think about it and I knew my parents and I knew the surgeon wanted me to have the amputation Mm. Um, at the end of the day it was my decision and so I had a boyfriend at the time Um, I was petrified if he'd stay with me if my friends would be friends with Mm. me those things are just running through your head and Mm. Uh, I went home and told them all and I think they just all went, no, you'll be right, you won't have to get your leg amputated until I realised five days later uh, I had scans from head to toe and realised how lucky I was after having cancer for, what, two and a half years it hadn't yeah. spread. Wow. Um, and chemotherapy doesn't work with this type of cancer so I was so lucky and then it sort of changed my mind completely that, you know, maybe I sh- do want to live a, li- a full life whether I have one leg or, or no legs or two legs. So it was it was a hard thing to process but also for me, the journey was a five-day turnaround from having two legs to, to one leg. So I didn't five have a days. lot of time yeah, to right. to really wrap my head around that. So that was five days make a decision and, and two days later, surgery. Uh, two days later. So surgery. within seven days, yeah. I suppose you kind of have to move, don't you? No, no. Have to no, rattle no, and shake. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's full on. There's a lot of people that, you know, <laughs> push the process back and try and save their leg and unfortunately it's too, it ends up being too late for them. So I'm so grateful that my parents kind of did give me that push. Did they give you a push? So were they? I think they sort of went. I, maybe my dad purposely left Dr. Google open. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, and the, and the doctor really laid it out for me about, you know, these, this is what can happen. You're and playing it, with it fire goes, if you don't goes, do it. Yeah, yeah, it goes straight to your lungs and rest of your body and then we pretty much can't do anything. So I knew that I was really lucky. And, and being – he was an oncologist and at the children's hospital. So, of course, I saw children that were never going to get the chance to go home and that sort of mm. made me – Start thinking so how pers- lucky that I'm gave you some perspective yeah. around your situation. Yeah, far out. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that's full on. So, so you have the surgery. What's the, I guess, what's the recovery like, and and what's that transition? Sort of transition and integrating yourself back into the things you used to do with two. Now you got to do them with one. Yeah. Look, I I'd be lying if I said I didn't think I'd come home and start walking straight away. The only leg that I'd ever seen on TV was off Juice Bigelow. I'm not sure if you've seen that. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I thought like, oh. I'm going to get this leg in two weeks. I'll be fine. That's oh. definitely not the case. It doesn't even look like that. <laughs> so that was in my mind. So, it, you know, it, it it took me back a bit when I realised that, wait a second, I've got a long road of, road of recovery. I had to get a wheelchair, which I think I used once because I just could not deal with somebody pushing me around in it. Mm. So I got crutches. This was in November and I think I got fitted for my first prosthetic leg four months later Um, and I went back to school on crutches and that was hard. I was finishing year 11 and year 12 and that was sort of one of the first things I said to myself is I want to get back to school on the first day. I want to get back to some normality and it was difficult. It was difficult because I, I had a, an amazing group of friends, a boyfriend at the time, my brothers, but they really deep down had no idea what I was going through. You know, yeah. I was in that stage of, you know, why me, why not any of them? You know, it's like yeah. they have no idea what I have to deal with. 
uh, and it was hard relying on people again being 15, having someone shower me, having somebody carry my books and um, it, was, it, was a, it was a big adjustment but I think that was one of the main things that pushed me to become independent again and, and really, you know, learn to walk and push myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That taking on that load at that age, like everyone else is worried about, you know, does that boy or girl like me or my grades or am I cool enough or whatever and you're dealing with- Yeah, my acne. Um, you got a bit of acne yeah, and stuff, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had the acne. Had oh, I, I had braces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that just felt like it was that big compared to, you know, getting your leg cut off. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Correct, correct. Yeah, the perspective and the resilience you would have built through those times would be amazing. Yeah, I think, and I've, I've said it before, you really don't know what you're capable of until yeah. you're thrown into that situation. And, uh, you know, I, I still deal with things on a daily basis, but at that time it was just a matter of, you know, I have to get through it. If I want to get on with my life and do the things that I'd planned to do before I lost my leg, I have no choice. I can't go sit in the corner and, and cry about it for the rest of my life. My leg's not going to grow back. Mm. Yeah. Um, and people pushed me in a good way, you know, to to keep going to the parties they were going to. to mm. You know, my boyfriend stayed with me for five years after that. It was just, you know, I just wanted to be as normal as possible, even though it was different. I was different. It was my normality now. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess you're, so, yeah. Sorry, God. Oh, Carson, you need Benny, oh, come Benny? on, mate. So, Do you want to take that, mate? It's, um, oh, it's a slab. Oh, that's, that's a slab. That's a slab. That's a slab. That's My bad, guys. Slab. <laughs> She's having a rough day. Benny's left his phone on. Oh, shout out, Spears. Spears, come on, don't you? Spears has got me in trouble. On the pod, Spears. <laughs> um, Callie, so doing, I guess, integrating back into life, but then there would have been some down moments as well. I guess, you know, you look like a very positive person, getting the positive mindset and, you know, it's well reported. You go on to do great things, but like, were there some pretty dark days where you come home from school and small country town, th- throw the leg in the corner, yeah, and go, "This is." F. Oh yeah, a lot. My pe- my poor parents copped most of me throwing my leg at them, to be honest. <laughs> um, and they, that was my biggest punching bag. So yeah, yeah, behind closed doors, I did struggle a bit, and I struggle. You know, I say that I did things with my friends all the time, but there was a lot of times I had to sit on the couch and not go and, and miss out because of the pain or the physio or, yeah. you know, recovery that I was doing. Uh, and the most frustrating thing, I think, being an amputee is learning how to walk and getting used to a prosthetic leg because it is so foreign. It is not yeah. part of your body. Yeah. Um, and it takes a long time for your leg prosthetist, leg maker, to understand what you're trying to tell them because they're not wearing it. And I really thought that I'd wear, get fitted for a leg and I'd just walk. And yeah, it was yeah. Such that's, a long process. That would have been my assumption as well. It's like, yeah. you know, which one do you want the- Oh, you know, that's another story. You don't get to pick which one. <laughs> <you want. laughs> yeah. so, so what is the process of getting the prosthetic? How does like, to, oh, that's something I'm quite intrigued in. Yeah, so I, I probably took about four months. Now they're, it's totally different going back 15, 16 years ago. They get you up and walking straight away. But for me, it was four months recovery. So I had staples. I obviously had major surgery through one of my biggest bones in my body. Mm. Uh, and then after those four months, they do a mold of your stump, what's left of your leg, and they fit a temporary leg to you. And this temporary leg is really crap. <laughs> it's like a door hinge with like a socket that doesn't fit very well, but they're expecting you to lose weight and for you to change. So you can't really get your finalized socket for a, a good few months, which is really frustrating. Mm. Um, and then even when you do get fitted for a leg, I probably was only able to wear it for an hour or two a day for the first two months because of... Um, building up the strength in my leg and my body. So that was frustrating. Uh, I had straps. So like the way my leg stayed on, I had to strap it onto my body literally. Again, we're going back 15 years, so Mm. technology's changed a a lot. Yeah. Um, But also I think it was five months after losing my leg, my friends were doing the debutante ball. I'm not sure if that's a thing up here or... Yeah, Yeah, the debutante ball. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'd been planning that for three years before I lost my leg and I had a partner and it was a dream and I still hadn't got my leg when all my friends started their dancing. And I I asked the the person if they still wanted to be my partner and he said, of course. And so I said, well, that's my goal. I'm going to learn how to walk, somehow dance. Um, and come out and do my dead ball. And that was the first goal that I set myself and I was so nervous. I didn't really want to do it, but I knew that I'd been looking forward to it for so long and I did it. I came out and I wouldn't call it dancing. I did somewhat of something (laughs) (laughs) and I proved myself that I, you know, can still do things. So it was, it was the little goals. That really setting, that's setting a big win, goals. a little yeah. win, but a big win, I guess. Yeah, it was, mentally, it was huge for me. It's a, and my dad turned around and said to me, Kelly, you know, I've seen you do this. You can do anything you want. And it was really, it was a turning point for me. Yeah, so setting yeah. that goal, achieving the goal, and then having the people around to to really prop you up. Yeah, and support definitely. You. Yeah. How amazing is that? So, <laughs> that? Sorry. So then, when did the sporting aspect 
come into it. So you've just done the Deb dance. Um, yeah. You've gotten through that. Are you doing sport now or you haven't even no. thought about that yet? I'd, I'd signed up for year 11, year 12 PE because obviously I told you school wasn't for me. So anything yeah. other than work. <laughs> yeah, <we'll be> <laughs> so <laughs> eco- economics in PE. Uh, uh, outdoor edge. <laughs> outdoor PE, edge. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, we, was, we would have been in all the same classes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was the distractive one. Yeah. Um, and I'd signed up, but I was so self-conscious at that point as well because I was wearing my brother's school pants on 40-degree days. Even though I knew people knew I had one leg, I didn't want oh, to be no. the odd one out. Um, and therefore, I didn't really feel comfortable integrating into sport because I didn't know how to play properly anymore or how to adapt it to myself. So I sat on the sideline for a good year um, while PE was on and – the PE teacher came up to me and gave me a flyer for a Paralympic talent search. And I'd already sort of wanted to, to learn how to run again and I'd sort of toyed with the idea. And I went along to this talent search and I walked into a room with people with disabilities and I'd never met anybody before and it just opened my eyes to, wow, these these people are missing arms, vision impaired, no legs, like, and they're competing for Australia and they're the best in the world. Mm. And that's sort of when I thought I want to be a runner and I want to compete for Australia. So it sort wow. of snowballed from there I still didn't include myself at school but um and I found out you needed a running blade that cost twenty thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars yeah so I told my friends at school obviously my parents they couldn't afford that it was not like I was asking for a new pair of runners to join (laughs) the netball club so Geelong community and my friends raised twenty thousand dollars and purchased my running blade and yeah all went from there that's that country feel again isn't it yeah getting behind 100%. 100%. How amazing is that? Definitely, yeah. I mean, I got $20 here and there from little old ladies, you know. That Yeah. How's your teacher, though? Yeah, yeah. I Your know. PE teacher yeah, yeah. changed the course of your life. Exactly. Which is incredible, right? Yeah. Yep. Just someone selflessly comes up and just gives you a pamphlet. Yeah. And that pamphlet just changes exactly. everything. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so thankful for that day and to be able to go along and, and meet the people that really, you know, push me to be who I am. Yeah. So so, so you so you do the fly, you go see, go see the team. Um, and then you start taking it seriously. When did that, yeah. you know, like did the penny drop and you were no. like, I'm going to do this. And, and just to, because you decide I'm going to be a runner and I'm going to go to the Olympics, like <laughs> yeah, oh, call yeah, me yeah. fucking strange. It's not yeah. that simple, is it? You know what I mean? <laughs> like you, you need yeah. to have some level of talent, leg or no leg. Yeah. To, I mean, you're still competing against the best yeah. in the world. So, yeah. I think like initially I'm a very competitive person. Like I always have to win. So that really <laughs> helped me. And... Uh, I went along and I went to this talent search. The talent search would have been six years before the London Paralympics. So that was sort of my goal. I got six years. I'm going to try and beat those London Paralympic Games. Um, And after about two years of training down at Landy Field in Geelong Athletics Track, um, it it took me a good two months to actually get out of the car and go to the athletics track because I was so self-conscious. There wasn't a group of disabled athletes or people with one leg I could go run with. I was just running with able-bodied. And Mm. that was really hard as a 17, 18-year-old girl. Um, wearing shorts and being down there and running a bit different and learning how to run again. But after two years of training, um, I probably wasn't full-blown athlete then because I didn't really know what it took until later on in my life. Um, But I scraped through as a wild card for the Beijing Paralympic Games and went along and competed, which was a huge shock. It was exciting, but I was used to competing at, you know, at the athletic track with about 30 people mm. to go to a stadium. Mm. Um, and then I went there and competed, came last. And it was it was an amazing opportunity because I sat in the stadium and saw my teammates and heard the national anthem. And that's yeah. that's kind of the moment that I said, All right, next four years I'm going to move up to Melbourne, away from my family and train for the London Paralympic Games and, and bring home a medal for, Shit, for yeah. Australia. So that was kind of, yeah. Yeah. That was a board home, so board home a couple there. just quietly. <laughs> yeah, well, that's how that's what pushed me through. I was aiming for that medal. I was aiming yeah. to be the best. And that, yeah. that's yeah. that's crazy because that? it's mind blowing. Just because you know, some people's goal would be, oh, "I'm going to go to the Paralympics," yeah. right? But your, that was never your goal, was it? Your goal not, was not, not you, after the first Paralympics. No, yeah, I yeah. To bring home you wanted medal. to bring home the gold. Yeah. So, crazy. So that time when you went to those games. You went there and you, I guess, appreciated the enormity of it. Yeah. How much it meant to all these people, and you probably started to think, how amazing would it be if I could do it? Yeah, and also, you know, what stays in the village. I mean, what happens in the village stays in the village. <laughs> yeah. But it is an incredible opportunity, the Paralympic yeah. Village. You know, yeah. we go in two weeks after the Olympians, and they always say that yes. the Olympics is a warm-up event for us. Hundred <laughs> um, percent. It's just like the dining hall is just—you could sit there all day and watch these incredible athletes from all over the world, and yeah. you know, people eating. 
um, their dinner with chop- uh, rice with chopsticks out of their toes because they've got no arms. And you just think, wow. how incredible is this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's just what, it's what inspires you to keep going and want to be part of a Paralympic team and wow. compete forever and ever. So, yeah, that's, that's yeah, at the moment that I knew that I wanted to keep going. So those next four years after Beijing, when you move to Melbourne and you start yeah. training, were they some of the toughest years, I guess, in training sense for you then? Yeah, definitely. I, I moved away from my family, which was hard, and I started the Institute of Sport and I trained seven days a week. So I was training four to five if I was lucky down in Geelong and this was a seven-day thing, sometimes twice a day. So wow. it was it was a different ball game and uh, I picked up long jump as well as the sprinting. So I had to do two events and it was – it was incredible, but I did I did feel quite isolated because, you know, my friends back at home who I grew up with weren't into the sporting scene and mm. you, even though you make amazing friends through sport, um, you're very isolated and narrow-minded for a while and that was sort of me for the next four years yeah. and it's, you know, got to me got me where I am today. Um, but it was it was a tough. It was tough. You know, sometimes you sacrifice things, you miss out on a lot, but it, it is all worth it in the end and... As I know more than anyone, sport's not forever. So I'm glad that I put that time into those four years. And do the AIS, are they paying for you to move to Melbourne and and like what happens there? Is it? No. So the VIS is not a living base. You go on rent, paid for my own rent. I worked part-time as well. Um, So so you're training seven days and then you still have to work on top of this. Yep. Some people work full-time. I was lucky that I had sponsors. (laughs) It's the hustle, man. Yeah. If it was easy, Daniel's son, everyone would be fucking doing it, dude. It's not that easy, man. It's, it's, it's changed a lot now. Paralympians are paid, I wouldn't say equally, but a yeah. lot better than what we were back then. So, unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of lot of money thrown our way. We did get paid to go to comp- – not paid. We got our competitions paid for and our flights most of the time if you made a team. But to make a team, you got to train and you got to put in the yeah. hard work and pay for yourself to fly everywhere. So it is financially very hard to be an athlete sometimes. Yeah. So what? So what job was that, Carl? Just so we can get a picture of training seven days a week, and then yeah. what? What did you go I was, and do? In your- I was lucky. I did motivational speaking as well, and also yep. sponsors. But I worked at the Victorian Institute of Sport, so yep. Yep. I did a lot of their reception work and a lot of um, tours and things like that. So yep. it was great that I was able to work and train and incorporate that and do it on my time a little bit. Yep. So yep. I was one of the lucky ones, but I know a lot of people you know plumbers and yeah. they were working yeah. Monday to Friday and then competing and training after work so you yeah. could tell how tired they were it was really tough and then we were integrated with the Collingwood Football Club watching them just train twice a day and go home <laughs> and get paid for that it was yeah. like, <laughs> these, these, these athletes that are training at 6am got to go to work come back at 6pm yeah. you know, yeah. so yeah. I think that's what's beautiful about the Paralympics is we appreciate everything so much because mm. we have worked so hard for it yeah. uh, and we appreciate every little bit that we get because, you know, like I said, it's changed a lot, but back then you didn't get a lot. A lot of airtime, a lot of, you know, money yeah. and praise yeah. there. So um, when you're just before coming into the London Games, did, was there a moment where you thought, yep, yeah, my times, I, I'm feeling pretty confident going over to these games. I think we're going to do well. Do you know what the other times are across the world? How does it? Like, yeah, like uh, I actually had a really big setback in 2011. Um, for about a year before that, I couldn't run. I couldn't even walk, to be honest, uh, because I damaged my stump so severely and bone spurs, as you know, that are coming ankles sort of were everywhere in my stump and uh, I didn't know what to do. So I actually found a surgeon in Sydney who did a re-amputation a year and a half out of the London Paralympic Games. So you did it all again. Gee, that's, that's yeah. a setback. A huge setback. If I've, if I've ever <laughs> oh, one. Fuck. Wow. Wow. Um, so the girl that I was actually training with at the time became number one uh, while I was out. Oh. And uh, I knew that I had to go get the surgery, fly back, liter- literally re-amputation, so a revision, and um, restart all over again. And I was in the gym five days after the amputation. I was doing everything possible. Mm. And then I came back and just my aim was just to beat her. And um, I started to get in front of her. <clears throat> Sorry. No, no, go for it. How's yeah. that? Got that bunny to chase. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's your, she's your training partner. Yeah. She wasn't for much longer after that. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, I want a new training partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She did. Were and you friends? I thought we were. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think now. She's probably friends. thinking friends like you. Who needs <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I just I aimed to come back and we had world championships only five months after that. Um, and I went there and came home with two gold medals. So, and beat yeah. her and beat all the others. Yeah. I was probably the fittest and strongest I'd been leading up to yep. that because I knew how hungry I was for it. I had to compete. I didn't necessarily have to win to get a ticket, but I had to compete and get a good time. And um, so, yeah, I I did know going into London Paralympics in that year leading up to it that I was going to be the one to beat. Uh, but there was a couple of girls 
in Italy and over all over the world that was were chasing me really hard. And so I was ex- I was hoping to get two gold medals, and I came home with a gold and a silver. But I ran a personal, personal best, best yeah, yeah, and you know world record for the long jump. So yeah, I was. Does happy. that still stand? No. Oh, I was doing. <laughs> it's how been far? Ten, how, been ten years now. How far? How far were you jumping? Um, I jumped about four forty. Four meters forty, and it's about five meters now. So, wow! Yeah, uh, that, so yeah, it's it's bound to get broken. But I mean, it's that's probably to the technology <laughs> in the blades as well. With that, that have to help. Yeah, yeah, and the training methods and stuff. Sure. Yeah, definitely. And um, but yeah, so it was it was an incredible experience to come home with with, with two medals. So. How was dad? Mum and dad. Oh, dad would have been buzzing. Yeah, dad. Dad's amazing. He's also one of those parents that are a bit too pushy when it comes to sport. You know, <laughs> <laughs> on the sideline screaming yeah. out at you. But yeah. <laughs> uh, I, they're my biggest fans, and they flew over to London to watch me. They've probably been at every competition that I've been at, and it wasn't just for me. The medals, it was for them as well because yeah. they were the ones that really supported me every step. I of just the way. think back to that day, the diagnosis, and your yeah. dad just like completely like lost asking the questions and trying to wrap his head around what he just heard and then yep. fast forward to seeing his daughter collect a gold medal olympic medal a, olympic gold medal you know and we know as australians mm. you know that's the pinnacle of sport yeah. that's pretty wild yeah yeah i think i think for me i've i got over losing my leg a long time ago but mm. i don't know that my parents have ever gotten over it i think they'll always have that thing in the back of their mind of never being fully able to wrap their head around what I went through. And so the moment I lost my leg to the moment I started to walk to run, I always sort of did it for them. I don't I don't know how at the age of 15 I, I thought like that, but I thought mm. I needed to show them that I would be okay. And that's what got me through as well, to show them that, you know, things are okay. I'll I got okay. this. Yeah. Wow. Is that, was that seeing them in that really hard place like that, yeah. that drove you to be like, it's going to be all right, mum and dad. I'm, you know, I'm going yeah. to get through this. There's not many moments that I remember, but this one I do, and it was a drive to the hospital from Geelong to Melbourne to get my leg amputated. And, um, you know, I told my, asked my mum if we could just turn around and do it another day. I was so nervous, mm-hmm. obviously, Far scared. Around, yeah. And mum just turned around and said, you know, Kelly, I wish I could take your spot in a heartbeat. Yeah. And that was kind of the moment where I was like, yeah, you're right. I, I, I do realise that. I know that they would. They would do anything mm. for me. And that was kind of where I was like, I sort of shut up and I was like, okay, I've got to go do this. Yeah. I have to just, you know, do it for myself and pretend that I'm okay. And I was okay, but at the same time, I had to do it for them, I think. That's pretty brave. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I want to go back to the gold medal. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, talk us through the race. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we just jump through you it. Know, all. I know. Te- oh, first, I want to expl- like understand. Mm-hmm. You've got <clears throat> your self pressure. You know you're going to be hard to beat. How do you go into Olympic games with that pressure on yourself, knowing you're possibly going to win a gold? And you're trying to win it for your mum and your dad and oh, everyone's. Well, you know. Is do you put pressure on yourself? Oh or- yeah. Yeah. I. And how do you deal with that? I guess. A sports psychologist. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I definitely had to see one to work through strategies of – I never slept. I remember the night before London, the, just the long jump specifically because that was sort of where I was better at than the yeah. 100 now. And I didn't sleep one wink and I took about 10 no-dos the next day. Yeah. <laughs> no-dos, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Straight down to the they shell. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was about to say, aren't they legal? Yeah, yeah. It's all depends caffeine. How, it depends how many you take. <laughs> um, and – you know, I, I worried so much about what everybody else was doing. And that was sort of my biggest downfall as an athlete, uh, except instead of just worrying about myself. Um, mm. But I kind of thrived on the pressure of winning because I, I just wanted to win so bad and I thought, I want to be the best. That's just my mindset. Yeah. Sometimes it's not a very And you were like dad. that before you were – Yeah, uh, I'm like, like that. Yeah, when you were netball and, and – Yeah, yeah. Like if I see a guy bench pressing, I'm, I'm going to bench <laughs> press <laughs> more than so, It's really bad to have because I get disappointed in myself very often. Yeah. Um, but that's what sort of pushed me was wanting to win but it was more the pressure of worrying about – I think what I struggled with, if I didn't win, would people still like me? That was kind of a big thing for me was if I don't win, am I good enough still? Yet when I look at other athletes who are just there good, doing their best, I don't think like that about yeah. them. So mm. that was my biggest, you know, weakness was always worrying about that. But again, maybe that's what pushed me to, to, to be who I am. To yeah. success, yeah. yeah. So you've – and that's probably a good segue into you wrapped up London and some awesome achievements. Then you come back home – let the hair down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, what happened from <laughs> As there? As you do after you win a gold, yeah. a bit of gold. And a silver. Drinking out of the And a silver. And a silver, yeah. In the, yeah. Like yeah. 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 In the hundred yeah. as well, mind you, in yeah. the marquee yeah. event. Um, yeah, so I came back. I was 
living by myself at the time and, you know, partying, doing the things that I'd missed out on. Um, and I thought I was actually really keen to get back into training after a month. I was a bit lost, you know, I'd, I'd lived this lifestyle of a schedule for so long that I was sort of like, what now? And it's so true. I remember sitting on my kitchen floor one day going, what now? Because I'd been at the top of my sport, I'd won. And then you just come crashing down at some point of, yeah. well, what now? Another four years or another, what am I going to do next? And so I, st- I was keen to get back into training. And literally like that, I went back to the track and I couldn't run. My ankle was just so sore. And I thought, what is this? Like I, it held together for London. It was great for the last four years. It was niggling here and there. And then for about a month, I wouldn't turn up to training. My coach would be there. I'd sort of just turn my phone off. I was getting quite down. I started despising the sport that I loved because I'd try and train. My ankle was sore. I'd try and put my foot on the ground. My ankle was sore. Um, yeah. And then I just felt really lost. I didn't know what to do. And Unfortunately, I had to have scans and I tried to have injections. I tried to fix it. Uh, and then after the scan showed the cartilage damage and the wear and tear, I had to have surgery. It really didn't fix it. It sort of helped it a bit. Um, and my option was to give pretty much to give up sport. Uh, and I'd been told that before bef- before London with my amputation, re-amputation and that wasn't an option. But this time I kind of sat back and thought, well, like, they told me that, you know, you need to walk when you're 50, 60 years old. You need mm-hmm. to really think about this. It's your only ankle. So I did. I sat back for a year and l- felt more lost than ever because I thought I was going to be competing in world champs and mm. Rio, then Tokyo, you name it. I thought I was going to be competing <laughs> yeah. until I was 60 years old. So it was a huge shock for me. So I did try and come back every now and then. Then it just made me go back even further because it would give me one good month of training and then the next two months I couldn't even walk. So... Um, eventually I had to give up the sport that I loved. I'd never officially retired cause I, and I still haven't. Yeah. <laughs> um, still hope. Yeah. There's that little bit of hope, but, um. Brisbane 2029. 20, yeah. And, but yeah, so for me, I'm, it was very tough. I lost my identity. I was worried about telling people that I wouldn't compete anymore because I thought that's all they followed me for. That's all they were friends with me for. So that was yeah. really difficult, um, until I, you know, I found my beautiful partner and so on and so on. But for a good couple of years, I struggled with, you know, mentally of who I was. Yeah, just because yeah. you relied on that athletic piece so yeah. much. Yeah, and it wasn't how I expected. I did not expect London to be my last international competition. That was, even though I was going in to try and win, I was just starting, you know. Yeah. That was sort of my first real international major win at a Paralympics. Wow, wow. So then you turned your hand to something else. Yeah. You couldn't, you couldn't go, this, you know what? No, for the next- <laughs> Another setback, I'm going to get. I'm going to overcome this and, and do something else. Try and keep me down. Yeah. Like I said, for a good few years, I sort of just, I was so lucky to have opportunities, be on TV, do great speaking gigs and work with wonderful brands, go on Dancing with the Stars. Yes. Um, and met my partner and, and had my first my first child. And then after that, I was like, i got to get back into sport. I got I was already in the gym, loved the, like I said, I was always mm. trying to outbench everybody. And that's when I found para powerlifting, which was bench press. And yeah. it made sense to me because I absolutely <laughs> loved it. You didn't have to stand on your ankle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and the Commonwealth Games was two years around the corner. And with the sport that I'd been in previously, there wasn't the opportunity to compete in the Commonwealth Games in my sport because we're integrated with able-bodied, they only pick a handful of disabled sports. Yeah. Um, para powerlifting was in Queensland, so I thought I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just aim to be. I was just gonna aim to be there this time. I wasn't going to aim to win a gold medal. <laughs> there was no chance in hell I was gonna win a gold medal in para powerlifting. Um, but I wanted to be the best in Australia, and I wanted yeah. to be the best of, version of me. So I qualified for the Commonwealth Games, came last. <laughs> um, but you know, but you had did it. So much fun, yeah. And yeah. It was it was a, a great sport. It's so different, but it's incredible. So how many athletes have um, like in general, qualified for two different completely. There's been like f- we got running and now we got powerlifting. Well, Alcott got- did tennis and basketball, maybe did he? Yeah, I think and he did basketball. You've got a couple of athletes that have done summer and winter. Yeah, um, oh, yeah. Which, is, which, which is quite incredible. Um, so there's been a few that have toyed with different sports. So I'm, I'm definitely not the first, but not many go from running to powerlifting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a bit different because I feel like you know the internet international lifters. I feel like you'd be up against some. Oh, there's some pretty, no some pretty big hell. athletes that could probably <laughs> lift a bit. bench a bit. <laughs> to put in perspective, my best like benching around the gym is about seventy kilos, but I weigh in the Ford under fifty kilo category. You yeah. bench seventy kilos. Yeah, so Jeez. I I'd come competition at sixty five has been my best, but in the gym I was benching and I always had to weigh myself 
because it was all done in weight category. Yeah. The women in my class under 50 kilos bench 120 kilos. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Jeez. So there's, uh, there's that. <laughs> For perspective, PK, how, how much can you lift, you reckon? Oh, nah. Oh, back, back <laughs> in the day. I'd be 50, Back 60. in the day. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But no, it's, um, that's, a, that's a lot. That's like, a lot. You know, like I'm 100 kilos, I could probably- Weight to weight. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the ratio, the ratio, yeah, yeah. Weight to weight, I'm doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. Then you've got like the men that are lifting triple their body weight. Triple their, yeah, that's right, so that's it's, right. It's, it's it's an incredible sport to watch and it's it's just bench press and you just lay on your back, you got your feet are strapped up, you don't even... And is it personal personal best, just one legit lift? You have three. Oh, three? Yeah, but you, you do oh, one but, come back out. But correct, it's so yeah. technically hard. So you will, you have to lift, you have to pause for a whole second and the bar can't mm. even move slightly when you come up. So when, oh, it, when, it's, when it's down, you pause when it's down. Yep, and Off you have the to, chest? If, yeah, it has to touch the chest Ooh, and it can't even go rest. down at all. Like yeah. it's so technically yeah. hard. And you come up and you think, wow, that's great lift and three red lights and you have oh. no idea what you've just done. Yeah, right. So a lot of people bomb out a lot. Because um, that's the thing, in being, being in the gym and getting under benches, yeah. People are like, oh, yeah, that's why I bench more PB, but it's yeah. a real static type it's, lift, yep. and then and then well, yeah. you just so, bounce off the chest. In the gym. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why Hollywood, Hollywood's got the hack. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I look at these people at the gym. I'm like, yeah, but you're not in benching. You're not in benching. Looks so, yeah. good though with all the weights on the side. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's uh, yeah, that's crazy. So you get into that space, and that's after having having your first child as well. So yeah. I find that super impressive as well like you you've gone full circle being that 15 year old young girl parents and and going through those hard times and then those really hard decisions you made as a 15 year old child yeah are because you wanted to live your life out and probably have maybe have a family of your own and now you're doing that yeah does that like yeah do you think about that much yeah and i think coming into sport again as a mum put things in perspective you know I, sport was not everything this time like sport was too much that time I, yeah. I did not have anything outside of it I had just one goal not healthy not at all, all. <laughs> no, you don't realise till you come out step out of it where you're like wow that was not healthy and now being a mum is the most important thing to me yeah. and my kids are and uh, I'm having more fun along the way and really enjoying it. And even though I may not be as fit as running, I'm definitely stronger mentally mm, yeah. being a mum and going <laughs> through all that. So um, it really helped me with that and I enjoyed it. And it, it's a juggle. It's a huge juggle, especially having two now and trying to do the things that I want to do. So, yeah, I was proud of myself to to make it there and to do that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fantastic. I think being, yeah, being a mother, just the mums out there, the, the respect of, yeah, bearing children is just amazing and especially to have go on your journey and be doing it now i think it's super super yeah. impressive i think for me i'm not done yet either so it oh. doesn't um, sound like it oh. you haven't hung the hung anything no up i yet. haven't i've never retired from anywhere so we'll see what i do but um i think i don't think i'm done i think i've definitely got more in me and i think it would be most likely powerlifting because it is a sport that's safer for me and yeah. what i can do but um, you know, wanting to have a family and do all that was sort of more important at that stage, and we'll see. We'll see where I go. What's the next Olympics coming up? I'm trying to pitch. It. I'm trying to think. Paris, but uh, the Commonwealth Games in Paris. 2026 are in Melbourne. 2026? Wow! That oh, that'd too, be exciting. Yeah. They were here before because I went. I we got a double. Sure. We got two in a row, I think. Melbourne. Yeah, we got. Yeah. We got- yeah. Regional. I think Geelong, you might be powerlifting in your own town. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that, that could be. We'll see. We'll see. You said you said earlier um, that you, you struggled with your friends like when, when it first happened and they, they didn't really – it was difficult for them to understand and you used to look at them and think, why me? Why not one of those guys and stuff? Yeah. And I think like um, I've had those that kind of experience when I was younger as well. I used to think, fuck, why me, man? Like, yeah. But what I've learned, and through your story, I think um, highlights it is, it's not just you. And as you get older, you start to understand that everybody has their thing. Maybe mine was when I was younger, yours was when you were 15, and there's other things that come and go, but that's what life's about. And and I think there's a quote that um, life is 10% about what happens and 90% about how you deal with what yeah. happens, you know? And I think, mm. yeah, the way that- yeah, like your your whole journey and story. Yeah, yeah, it's the yeah. epitome of it, man, yeah, which is, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really interesting because I always sort of get asked if I think it happened for a reason, you know, and I don't yeah. believe anything happens for a reason. I hate that much. <laughs> um, but I do believe that I was dealt with something that I could handle, you know, 
maybe better than some um, mm-hmm. who I was. But also, like you said, it's how you deal with the situation that you dealt with because a lot of people think, well, aren't you happy or glad that it happened because look what you've, where you've been. You've been over the world. Um, but I didn't get a ticket to the London Paralympic Games. I didn't get a ticket to the Commonwealth Games. You know, I've worked really worked. hard for yeah. what yeah. I've, yeah. I've done and I chose to do that. I chose to pick myself up and, and do motivational speaking and, and – put a face out there for people with disabilities and and do what I do. So I think it's, it does, it it shows what you're dealt with, how you deal with it. It makes you who you are. It's like you've got a real strong mindset and I think you've had that all your life. Yeah. And that's another good point as well. I always sort of get, um, you know, you know, how, how, how did I overcome things or, um, you know, am I, you challenge yourself. Yeah. And how did I become so resilient? And yes, I think, you build resilience going through hardship and what you've gone through, but also I think it's part of who I am and yeah. and um, how I was brought up and also who, you know, who what I was born with. So it's it's sort of a bit of both, I think, for me. And um, I'm lucky to mentor other people that are going through something very similar and I just hope that I can show them, you know, what is still out there and, and mm. you know, what you can still achieve. Well, you turned it into a blessing, right? Like it was a nightmare and through your mindset and your choices, like you said, the choices and things you've done, yeah. you turned it into a blessing not just for yourself but your family and the whole of Australia, right? Because we all get to enjoy in your success, whether it be on Dancing with the Stars or the Olympics and all of that stuff. But through your choices, yeah, you you, you flipped it on, on its head and, and yeah. you turned it into a blessing by inspiring your dad. Like I was talking about your dad because like you were saying earlier, like it hit me hard because I've got two young daughters and I just couldn't rack – I'm the dad, right? Yeah. I'm the dad. I'm sitting there going – Far out, like how is like I just couldn't wrap your head. So yeah, and but you've flipped it on its head, and then you've gone and inspired him and your and your yeah. parents and all these people that you deal with one on one and the motivation. It's a crazy, crazy story. You must, yeah, you must be your dad's hero. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> and, 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 and sorry, dad, sorry to the boys, yeah, no. <laughs> but which again yeah. flipped it on its head, right? Because most kids, you know, you're on my daughter's, on my daughter's hero, right? Yeah. But somehow you've, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more yeah, that you're you you're, you're, your dad's hero. Yeah. I think Absolutely, so. we do fight a lot. We ah, yeah. oh, we do too as well. Don't yeah, we? yeah, it's, yeah, all yeah, yeah. it's all part of the ex- yeah, exactly. the experience. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm glad I can make them proud. But I also think as well with the whole, you know, I've flipped it into a blessing, and that's so important because I sort of think we get stuck with people thinking that. Oh, I think we spoke about Dylan Walcott before talking about how he's glad he has a disability and how he's glad what he's done. And I think the prime minister said something about, you know, I'm glad that we. Um, don't have any. Well, we don't have children with a disability, and sort of yeah, it's a bit of an geez, uproar. Yeah. Mm. I disagree with that. Yeah. I think that we've got to be careful not to speak to, for everybody because yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would take my leg back in a heartbeat over what yeah. I've done. I'd want, yeah. I'd want two legs, and that's not because I'm upset. That's not because I'm sad. Um, it's financially and physically a lot better to have two legs than one leg. <laughs> so we need to be careful of you know speaking for everybody with blanket statements yeah. yeah yeah so i turned what i had into a great achievement but there are people with disabilities who have chronic pain who can't mm. get out of bed every day yeah. who haven't got the paycheck that some athletes have um you know all the opportunities so we have to be mindful of um using that in a way where you know some people don't want their disability and don't want to you know talk about it in that way so i think that's a really good point to make that you know i chose what to do with mine and, and be mm. that person um and i'm i'm grateful for the opportunities and the people that i've met along the way and i, I wouldn't be the person i am today if i hadn't have gone through what i did mm. but yeah i'd probably rather too still take the lead absolutely <laughs> exactly yeah mm. yeah that's definitely. super super realistic though isn't it yeah yeah and, and yeah. i think i try to be honest because you know it's not fun it's not fun having children having to hop up hop in the middle of the night tending oh. to a baby you know you know so that's that, that's the bit that i started thinking about I yeah. thought, these amazing things she's done and you know i'm at home wrestling with my kids and and you're doing the same thing um with a handicap yeah you know it's 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 phenomenal it is and it's it's i don't have a choice anymore to sit down and take my leg off and relax you know my kids need me 24 7 yeah. so mm-hmm. i don't get that break anymore so i've got blisters to work through i've got pain sometimes i don't have a choice you know to sit down and sometimes i decide to sleep in the bedroom with both kids because i can't bother getting up to <laughs> yeah but, you know there's just things it's all yeah. three kids are gonna be in my bedroom soon i think <laughs> yeah, um, yeah yeah so it is it's just little things that you just wish you didn't have to deal with but you do deal with it because i have to mm. and that's just life Deal with it Has it ever it. become somewhat like normal? Do you know what I mean? Where you kind of forget about it and it's just, you know, life. Yeah. Even when you were training and stuff, when you were zoned in on being yeah. the best and stuff, like that helped. Yeah, sort of it, take you away from, oh, my leg, my leg, my leg, because yeah. I feel like your whole life is, a lot of your life has been wrapped around that story. I think it's just 
yeah, it's it's normal for me. I've, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even remember what it's like to have two legs. Um, but every time I go to the supermarket with my leg out, I'm reminded that it isn't normal. So you know, there's oh, there's of days course, where other I, people, yeah, and you know, there's there's days where I completely forget that I've got one leg, and even my partner does, and my friends do. And then there's days where I just wish I wasn't the one that people were staring at that day. I wish I'd blend in. So you have moments where you sort of like, um, you know, you wish you did have two legs and then sometimes you're like, oh, I didn't even notice because that's just who I am and am now. And I'm used to getting up and putting my leg on in the morning like you would be your shoes and mm-hmm. taking it off for a shower and taking it off for bed and um, things like that. You just you find a way to navigate life in your way afterwards. Yeah, yeah. You, you find your normal. Yeah, and that's where I try to encourage people with whatever disability is, especially something that I went through, they may not want to go to the gym anymore or they may not want to do the things they did But and I won't – lie to them it's going to be different it's going to be harder but you find a way to do it It may take you longer you may look silly or different doing it yeah but you can always get through it in your own way and you just got to find your own happiness and it may not be the olympics because exactly one of my best mates uh he's in a he's in a chair podgy podge podgy man shout out podgy legend and we went to school together at a motorbike accident and i remember like People, you know, you do this, do that, do this. But you know what? Podgy's just a chill dude, you know what yeah. I mean? And he didn't want to do that and he's happy and he's at home and he does his own thing. He actually played table, he played, did play table tennis for Australia. He come he come and played table yeah, that's tennis. That's right, remember that? A little segue. And he whipped us. I go, he wait till he mate comes. Tennis. And I thought, I thought, oh, I was going all right. He goes, in your chair, right? I go, we, we, we were you. playing every day and I was sort of like, well, I'm going to beat this guy. <laughs> oh, mate. He flogged you. Yeah. Oh, flogged me. Yeah, he lined us up, <laughs> man. Lined <laughs> us up next and we're just running us everywhere. But yeah, to your point though, yeah. like, he just his happiness was just he found his own happiness, you know, being with himself and he he, he stays at home and he's pretty yeah. quiet and he's got his tight group of friends. But he's genuinely happy, man. Yeah. And you know, and that's why. So I, I think, yeah, it's, it's a good point. Like everyone's gonna be different and how they deal with it and mm. it's just about finding their their happiness, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and I being think content. that's important because, you know, Dylan Alcott and people like him have done incredible things for people with disabilities. The awareness, you know, the things he actually gives opportunities for people. But we also have to be aware that not everybody wants to be an athlete. Yeah, there's podgies out there. We only give voices at the time of the Paralympics is on or when people are doing incredible things. Yeah. When I want to normalise disability in every aspect of life. You know, yeah. on TV, yeah. on normal TV, you know, dating or, you know, working and having the same opportunities, opportunities as everybody because you're right. I think it's funny because I'm in a world where – I would be with my coach and he'd see someone with a disability and be like, oh, I'm going to get them to come play. Uh, you know, that's just his mindset. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, maybe they don't want to play sport. You know, maybe <laughs> yeah. they just want to be left alone. Yeah, yeah, but that yeah. was his mindset. So yeah. Yeah. I think we've got to be mindful of that as well, of people just wanting to do the things they want to do. Yeah. That, that's yeah. bridging though, that gap. Yeah. I, I feel like as I've grown oh, yeah. up and my kids, because my kids, like I was saying, Podgy's my best mate. Yeah. So my kids don't know any different. Yeah. You know, the conversation with Podgy or, or whatever isn't, Podgy's not in a chair to them. Podgy's just Podgy, yeah. you know. So I feel like, and, and I think like the Paralympics is a big part of that as well. Turning like, the TV on and turning seeing TV, people Yeah, for sure. And people like Dylan, you know, it's, yeah. it's incredible. It's one of those cool yeah. things that our generations, it's, we're part of the change, which, well, is, the which access, is awesome. Isn't it? The access to yeah, sharing yeah. the information and, yeah. You look, you look at the last Paralympics, like the audience was huge. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to the previous years. Yeah. And I feel like yeah. it's just going to grow and grow from now. And I think it's, I think that's another thing. It's been, it's been big for a while, but it's never been on tele, you know, televised for people to be able to see it and have yeah. the opportunity. So, like I said, I remember being in primary school and then wheeling the the TV in to watch uh, Michael Klim or mm, you know, Perkins. Yeah, but there yeah. was never they never wheeled the, yeah. the TV in to watch any Paralympics. True. So yeah. I didn't know about it really growing up. So now I go to primary schools, my children's schools and, you know, talk about the Paralympics and now it's something that they really well, start to learn about. Well, 100% because my kids at school, they didn't just – they weren't just rolling the TV in for the – the, the, 100%. Yeah. And they were learning about the athletes and all of that. So exactly. that – 100%. So there's a shift happening, which is cool. And that's great for that little – Billy, who's sitting in the classroom with one leg, thinking, "Wow, now I can." Yeah, do this. absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, it opens yeah, yeah. Mind. That's pretty special, and you being a part of that's pretty yeah. awesome. As well, isn't yeah, it? yeah, definitely. Awesome, um, Kelly. One last thing we like to do is ask a question for our audience that yep. you know they might be they might be battling, or they might be looking to to take that opportunity, or or maybe you know step off that line. What advice would you give someone that's that's looking to you know I guess probably similar to what to what you did? You were sitting on the sidelines. And then you went and started looking at being, becoming a runner. Injected what, yourself what, back into the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like wrestled yourself back in, you know, yeah. with a with an amazing mindset. What would what advice would you give? Oh, first of all, go for it. But I think the biggest achievements in my life have been when I've stepped out of my comfort zone and, oh, and I've yes. said no to opportunities that um, 
and then you know I had a second thought and thought no I'm going to do it I'm going to and they're the best times that I've ever had because mm. they've showed me mentally and physically what I'm capable of um, and even if you have little setbacks you just keep going so I you know step outside your comfort zone push yourself and surround yourself with people that are like-minded but want to see you succeed and yeah care about you no matter what you're doing as long as you're happy and we'll see you all the way through. So have a really great support network um, and believe in yourself. And then also we're, we're in a world now where you can contact anyone on social media and you've got questions, contact somebody who's been there, done that, or, mm. you know, a role model. And I'm sure they'll reach out back to you and give you some advice yeah. on, on something that you really want to do. Yeah. Good advice. Advice. So that's what we've great found advice, yeah. doing this podcast, right? Most people, good people, successful people mm. want to give back. They want to help. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent, and, yeah, and that's and that's what people say. They go, "How do you get?" Yeah, hundred percent. And we <laughs> at the start, we didn't know at the go, start. Yeah, yeah. What, like you, you know, go through friends, they go, <laughs> <laughs> friends, friends. Yeah. It's not what you know it's too. <laughs> but but just someone like yourself, Kelly, you're so motivated to to give back and get that message out there to try and just just equal things out and and try and try and change one person's mindset. Yeah, I think I've always remember going back to my story when I was in hospital. If somebody came up to me in that hospital room and showed me, not like you said, not just being an athlete, but what you could have a family, you can still travel the world, you can do all those things, would have made my parents and myself feel a whole lot better about my future. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. now you want to be that Yeah, for other people. For other yeah, people. definitely. I find that strange that that wouldn't have happened. It does now. Well, yeah. but, but you've got to remember, the times ages. were different 15 yeah. years ago, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's, ago it's wild. Yeah. Like, the internet barely existed, True. man. Do you know what I mean? Like, we have the reason why and, and sport's so great is because that's how you contact people now. So, yeah. you know, yeah. I get a there message was, from somebody because they've seen me do sport to go and contact someone at the hospital. So, yeah, okay. um, there's been lots of families that I've met and I'm I'm glad that I can show them, you know, what what their kids or that's what the blessing. their future looks like. Yeah. yeah. And oh, sorry, I just want, is is that a bigger, um, does that give you more gratitude than winning gold medal when you're going to <laughs> like, oh, yeah. I feel like that would be gold pretty special. Pretty no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I think half the reason, like obviously, like I said, I love winning and doing things. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're going to be tough to get that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, to, to be honest, half the reason I do what I do is because I want to inspire people and show people that um, you can, doesn't have to, have, you don't have to have one leg, but you can Anything's be different. possible. Yeah, just be, I just want people to understand that what not one mold fits mm. everything and you can be who you are, look what, what, look how you look and do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. What oh, a yeah, that's powerful insane. message that's you're awesome. doing! Some amazing Thank stuff, you. Kelly. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on. The, the, yeah, the big one for me was finding your own finding your own normal. Yeah. yeah, finding your own normal. Like whether it's you know disability, whatever it might be, everyone's trying to find their own normal. Yeah, exactly. Sitting next to a guy who's trying to find his own normal. <laughs> you know, we're but not it, normal, but, <laughs> but it is. Yeah. None of us are normal. Yeah. yeah, and 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 looking at what everyone else is doing and looking on this bloody thing and, and looking at social media, what normal looks mm. like. Yeah, I feel like your normal can be whatever you want it Anything. to be and whatever Absolutely. it sits with you. Yep. Um. So I reckon that was really powerful. Anyway, thanks, Kelly. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Legend. Thank you. Continue yeah, the good star. work. Thanks, guys. Please like, share, subscribe. There was so much value in that. Please share it to anyone that Come thinks- on. We need some help with the algorithm. Come on! <laughs> Any, anyone that needs a bit of perspective, if they're having a bad day, you can push through it, make the hard calls, get excited. What do you think, Hollywood? Man, I reckon, yeah. yeah. If you're out there, man, and you're looking in the mirror thinking, poor me, you know what I mean? Like, this, if there's not enough, some perspective in here today, what we've learned today to just- Grit the teeth? Yeah, roll the sleeves up and go and have a go. Fall over, get back up and just keep moving forward. Strong mindset. Yep. Strong mind. See you at the top! <laughs> oh, Hollywood! <laughs> <laughs>